when you mentioned at the beginning about why place boards are so relevant or that part of the steadiness with hunting dogs, you know, upland or uh, a duck dog, that's a huge thing. Steadiness is having that dog not Mm -hmm. break. This is, this also translates to everyday life. So think if you're out there in your driveway and you're washing your truck or you're doing something and your dog's out there with you rolling around in the yard and you see somebody coming jogging down the street. If you tell that dog, if you place that dog, it's not going to run out there and, you know, or the same thing when you're in the house and, and the mailman shows up and knocks on your door, this, this, the lessons that can be taught with this strategy are beneficial throughout a dog's uh, a dog owner's and a dog's life in so many ways that are beyond hunting. It's a safety thing. Right. It's a dog manner thing. It's a behavior thing. It's all of it. And so, so remember that when we're talking about this, this is just, isn't a hunting thing. Um, and so before, before you move on, um, do you think when, so when you're talking about this being a positive experience association, so you the, this dog learns or your dogs learn place board, something good's happening, buddy. If I get if I plant my butt down on that, I get a retriever, I get to work or I get to do something. Do you find that because they're centered and they're in their spot and that now they're anticipating, okay, he's going to tell me to do something I want to do, that you have their attention better? Like they're like, all right, buddy, I'm focused on you. Yes, definitely. Okay. Definitely. It, it puts them in that mindset. And that starts really early. Like with a young, say an eight or nine week old puppy, they start being conditioned that when there's a place for it out there, something is going to happen. So, so yes, they're definitely more focused on me when they hop on there. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you that because I keep thinking about this. You know, I, you have little kids. I have twin seven year olds and I, I see people work their dogs and they they are issuing commands when the dog is clearly not paying attention to them. So there's mm-hmm. there's these commands floating out into the ether that aren't doing anything. And the same thing happens with your kids. If your kids are focused on something and you're like, hey, you got to go, you got to put your book bag away or something. If they're not paying attention, it, to ain't you, happening. it doesn't happen. And so you're yeah. w- essentially what you've done with these is create a positive association training tool that allows you to just have that better working connection with your dog when it's in play. That's right. Yeah. And I could take those. So you saw it at Purina. I had place boards there and that was a brand new environment for these dogs. It was hot out. We were in the sun. There's like 20 new people there that they've never met before. They'd spent the last two nights in the truck in a parking garage. Like they, there was nothing about that whole situation that would make those dogs think I want to get out and do some work. Right. Yep. But yet, when I took them out and they saw those place boards, they knew, they knew what the gig was. Right. I mean, I think if you remember like a couple of those dogs, as soon as they saw those place boards, they ran and jumped on them right away. Yep. Rather than going to say hi to the people, they went to the place board because they wanted to work. Yep. Well, any, and you, you'll probably get into this, but one thing that you pointed out there and when you were at my house and we were shooting some photos was it actually, we, I actually saw your dog self-correct. Where sometimes mm-hmm. they would, you know, they were so excited, they'd start to break and they'd be like, nope, my spot's there. And he didn't issue the command. And you could see instead of just the full on break, they went, oh, I'm supposed to be on there and got back on. That's right. Yep. Which is, which so, is cool. Yeah. It's very different, isn't it? From yeah. a, a dog that's been restrained. It, it, that's a dog that's fully engaged in the process, in my opinion. Yep. Like they feel like they're, they're part of it. And it's, it's no different than I use the analogy or illustration where if you, if you're working for an employer, that's always making you do your job and they just, they micromanage you and they force you to do it. When that person, when that micromanager isn't there forcing you to do it, you're, you're not going to do it the same way. You're going to say, you know, screw that guy. I'm going to do it my own way today. Right. Yep. Cause there, that force isn't there. But if you work for somebody who just said, Hey, here's the expectation. Like this is, this is the result I want this is your job. Like you do it how you want to, but this is what the end result needs to be. And they don't, and that's like the extent of the management. They're not forcing you. That person that's now taking ownership of their job, they're going to do it the same way every time, regardless of if they're being forced to do it or not, because they're not being forced to do it. And the same way with the dog, if we're, if we're forcing and forcing and forcing, that dog is going to look for an opportunity to do it their way. But if we give them the job and they're fully engaged in it and they take ownership of it, then they do it the right way, regardless of if, if we're, if we're there or not. 
Yep. Yeah. There, there's a line in one of my favorite tool songs. It's there's no love and fear and man, it's, it's true <laughs> in a lot yeah. of different ways. And so, yeah. all right, so let's get in, let's get into like, you, you, you started to learn the process and develop your process for taking high drive dogs and, and working this place board into its full capacity with them. Sure. I start with, in order to steady a dog, I have to have a dog that likes to retrieve, right? There's, there's no challenge in steadying a dog or having a dog sit there for a retrieve if it doesn't want to retrieve in the first place. But that doesn't mean you have a steady dog. It just means you have a, a dog that <laughs> it, maybe you need a different dog, right? So <laughs> I I early on start out trying to develop this love for retrieving. So they just they want to get that ball or that dummy more than anything. And it starts when they're eight or nine weeks old, usually. And this is definitely a case of less is more. So if we go out with an eight week old puppy and we give it 10 retrieves and the first three retrieves, it loves it. The, the next five, it's okay with it. And the last two, it doesn't want to do it. Like we just created a problem there because in that puppy's mind, it doesn't remember the first three retrieves that it loved. It remembers the last two retrieves when it was tired and it wasn't having fun. So the next time we take it out there and we start to do retrieves with it, the thing that it remembers is, how, boy, this isn't very fun. I remember getting tired and all the repetition. Yeah. So I take a, a young puppy and I make it fun. And we do two, maybe three, but usually it's only two retrieves per, per session. And I'll take, I'll actually start introducing them to the place board at this time, but it's a really passive introduction. So the place board is there. They don't know what it is but they go look at it. I mean, it means nothing to them at that point. Right. But I take the tennis, I'll take a little tennis ball or if they don't like a little tennis ball. I'll take a rag and I'll tie a knot in the middle of it. Just anything that they like, like there's no reason to take a hard chunk of plastic and ask a puppy to retrieve it. It doesn't like it. It has baby teeth. Like that doesn't yeah. feel good at all. So let's just give it something that it wants to have in its mouth so we can get some good repetitions. So I'll take, we'll just say it's a little tennis ball. And I'll tap the top of the place board with that tennis ball. The puppy comes to see what it is. And now I get it to chase that tennis ball around in my hand, just in a little circle. It's trying to get it in my hand. And then I'll flick that tennis ball out. Not long. I mean, not a long retrieve, right? There's no reason to give a puppy a 20 yard retrieve because we're not working on marking ability right now. We're just working on creating retrieve drive. That's the only thing we're trying to do at this point. And usually I'll actually do that in the hallway. So there's no, no distractions all the doors are closed in the hallway. So there's nowhere for it to go, but to come back to me. So we flick out like a little eight foot retrieve with that tennis ball. The puppy runs and jumps on it. And as it's coming back, I'm tapping the, the top of the place board and calling it to me. It hops on that place board. Ideally, sometimes it tries to get away from me. Sometimes it doesn't want to come back, but usually it's going to run back and it's going to hit the top of, of that place board. I'm going to pet it, take the ball away from it, let it chase that ball around in my hand again. And then I flick out another little retrieve that brings it back. We do the same thing. And then the third time I get that puppy chasing the tennis ball in my hand and it's once it's so bad. And then I put the tennis ball in my pocket and it's over. So tomorrow or the next day after that, when I bring that tennis ball out, that puppy remembers wanting that tennis ball so badly and not being able to get it. So we're creating like almost like a neurotic retrieve, right? Like I want it, I want it, I want it. I can't have it, but I want it. That's like, that's what I want out of a puppy is where when it sees that tennis ball, it wants to re to retrieve it more than anything. And by doing very little retrieving, that's how you create the drive, not by doing a lot of it. So I always challenge people, why did you throw that retrieve for that puppy? Did, what was your reason? Typically, they don't have a, re a reason. It's, well, I don't know. It was retrieving. So it looked like it was having fun. So I threw it, right? Which Which is great for an older dog. That's fine. But with a puppy... I want to be extremely intentional about what I'm doing with that puppy. So let's not do just stupid repetition. Let's do, let's do smart actions here. So a puppy, now we can do all sorts of other training. You can teach that puppy to sit. You can teach it to come. You can maybe start leash training it if you want to. You can start crate training. You can, so you can do all those things. But when it comes to retrieving, like don't screw that one up. Keep that retrieve drive as high as possible because it will make everything else so much easier down the road. Yeah. So, so I start developing that retrieve drive for the, say the first five or six months of the puppy's life. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's a little less. 
every dog is a little bit different. But when they get to an age where they show me that they want that ball more than anything else and they're not going to quit and they're just going to they're going to pound it every time. Right. They're a hard driving retriever at this point. They've had no patience built into them at this point. They've never had to wait for a retrieve. They've never like they've always just seen it and gotten it right. Mm -hmm. Got on the place board and the retrieve happened. And I'll step back a little bit when I take that eight week old puppy and I give it retrieves off the place board. Usually by about the third or fourth session, when I bring that puppy out and it sees the place board, it'll hop on it immediately because it knows that's like the launch pad for the retrieve or the trigger for the retrieve. So, hey, I'm on here. Look, I'm on here. Throw me a retrieve. Right. And that's great. That's where I want them because they're starting to associate that place as a, as a place of work. So now we get to arbitrary age here, but let's say a six month old puppy loves to retrieve, understands what the place board is. Now I go out there and I put that dog on the place board. I tell them to sit. So they know sit at this point and they know place. They hop on the place board. And I'm going to take that tennis ball that they love so much and that they've gotten immediately every time in the past. And I'm going to hold that tennis ball out straight away from my body at a 90 degree, 90 degree angle. And when they see the tennis ball, Every single time, if, if you did your job right, that puppy is going to launch off of the place board and come over there and try to get the tennis ball out of your hand because they love that. It's their toy. They want it, right? Mm -hmm. I, I pull that tennis ball back into my body, put the puppy back on the place board. There's no correction at this point. It didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't know what the expectation is. So there's, there's no reason to correct because it doesn't understand. Yep. Back on the place board, we tell it to sit again. I step away by a few feet. I hold the tennis ball out again. As soon as it comes off the place board, which will be immediate, I pull the tennis ball back into my body, back to the place board. And we just keep going through this repetition, maybe, well, as many times as we need to. Usually within five to 10 times, the puppy will sit there and look at the tennis ball. Like, what Like what the heck do I have to do to get that thing, right? What are you doing? It's, it's more of a state of confusion at this point, but they stop. And as soon as they'll stop, like they pause for just a minute, or not even a minute, they pause for a second, maybe tilt the head a little bit. I'm going to drop the tennis ball and say their name as soon as I drop it. So they come off the place board, they get the retrieve. We go back to the place board. Good dog, good dog. We take the ball away from them. What a good dog. Back on the place board, sitting position. I step away. I hold that tennis ball out. And now it may take a few repetitions, but pretty soon that dog starts to understand if I sit here long enough, He'll drop that ball and I get the retrieve. So they'll sit there and wait for the ball to get dropped. Perfect. Next step is now I introduce a little bit of motion. So I'll start to lower my hand toward the ground. And every single time when I lower my hand every with every dog or every puppy, as soon as that motion is introduced, they jump off the place board and they come over to get the ball. Ball comes back into my body. You can't have it back on the place board. Sit. Good dog we do the repetition over and we get to where that dog will allow me to move my hand around with the tennis ball and it'll still sit there. When it does that, I'll drop the tennis ball, send it for the retrieve, you know, simultaneously I drop and send at the same time. Yep. The next step is I get to where I can touch the ball to the ground. And again, every time the, when you do it the first time and touch that ball to the ground, the puppy's going to come off the place board, just pick the ball back up, back on the place board, sit good. We do it over. Pretty soon, and I would say with most dogs within two to three sessions, you can get to where you can set that ball on the ground next to you and the puppy won't come off the place board until you send it. If it does come off the place board before you send it, you just reach over, pick the ball up before the puppy gets to it and you, and you do it all over again. And that's like, that is how that process works to get that dog to where it understands if I sit here, I get the retrieve. If I come off of here, I don't get the retrieve. So it wasn't forced to stay there. It was just deprived of the reward. Yep. So it learns if I want the reward, I have to stay in this place. And then pretty soon I'm getting to where I can toss that tennis ball behind me by four or five feet. If the puppy does come off, I'll step back, pick the ball up before it gets to it. We do it over again, but pretty quickly I can roll that ball a little ways. Once it shows me that, then I start slowly moving closer to the dog and off to the side of the dog. And we start doing retrieves farther away. That process, like it's really, it seems really simple, right? When I, when I figured it out, it seemed like revolutionary to me. I'm sure it's not new to me, but I kind of did figure for me, I had to learn it the hard way on my own. It took a long time. When I figured that out, I was like, well, this is, 
this is awesome. Now, when I tell you it, it seems like such a, like a silly, easy, simple process, but I'm, I'm telling you it works. Like when you engage the dog that way, where they're learning, if I sit here, I get the retrieve. If I don't sit here, I don't get the retrieve. Like they take ownership of the process and uh, like your results, oh, they just become so honest with it. So then I get to where I'll, I can, I can stand next to the dog. I can, I can throw a retrieve for it. It's still sitting there. Now I'm going to start asking it to do a little bit more before it can have that retrieve. So we always, the tendency in training is always to train to the bare minimum, right? So we say, well, I want a dog that's steady for, for a retrieve. So we make the dog sit next to us. We throw a ball for it and then we send it for the retrieve. That's what we want it to begin with. Right. But if we always train for the bare minimum, any sort of mistake at that point is going to be catastrophic, right? Like if we just wanted to sit there until it gets a retrieve, but it doesn't sit there. Well, now like we just, we didn't do the job, right? We broke. So it's, yep. it's like a catastrophic failure, I would say. So it's always important in my opinion, to try to train to a higher level than what the expectation is. So I'll take a six month old puppy that's just been steadied, line steadied. I'll throw a ball for it. And then I'll step back the other direction four or five feet and I'll call that dog over to me. So now not only does it have to wait for that retrieve, it has to go away from the retrieve. And now I'm starting to make that dog think more. So it's not sitting there thinking, when is he going to say my name so I can make that retrieve? It's sitting there thinking, am I going to get called away from this retrieve or am I going to get sent for that retrieve? And now we've added this insulator. We're now like, instead of like a failure being catastrophic where it broke, now a failure might be it's sitting there and you said, come. And instead of coming to you, it went for the retrieve, but it still waited until it heard a command. It's still a failure, but at least showed we, we added one layer of insulation between the task that we wanted and, and, and what that dog did. So I, I always try to gain, like you say that your dog recalls, that's great. Uh, will it recall when, you know, there's another dog out there or when there's another person out there? So like you always got to train to that higher level. You can't just say, well, he comes when I call. Well, does he come when you call when there's this level of distraction? Same with steadiness. You say he's steady. How steady is he? Can you call him off of that retrieve? Could you throw a different retrieve for him and send him for that one? Could you throw a different retrieve and then call him off of both of those retrieves? And I, a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, it's like, he's just a puppy. Like that's above his pay grade, right? You would be amazed like how, what these puppies can learn if you set the expectation high enough. So if your expectation is really low, like that's all you're going to get. But if you set your expectation high, typically those puppies will, will just, they start to realize like, well, this is just what we do. Like I, I he's calling, there's the retrieve, but he's calling me. I'm going to come into him. What else does he want me to do? And it's no different than you tied kids into it earlier. It's not really any different than kids, right? Like if we want a kid to, if our expectation for a child in the morning is that they wake up and stagger to the, to the, to the table and then we feed them and then they go, then they go out and play. Like that's what the kid will do, right? Every morning he'll stagger out to the table when he wakes up, we'll give them their food and then they'll go play. Cause that was the expectation we set. Now, if you take that same kid and you set the expectation that when you wake up, you make your bed, maybe you brush your teeth. Oh, I'm just throwing like that these are not my kids right now. This is all like hypothetical. <laughs> you make hypothetical your bed, you brush children. your teeth. <laughs> yeah. Hypothetical children. You make your bed, you brush your teeth, you come out, you, you get your breakfast together yourself. You, you know, you make your breakfast, you eat your breakfast, you put your dishes away and then you go out and play. Well, it's the same kid, but we just set a different expectation for that kid yeah. and it doesn't know any different. So it's going to do it. Right. It's whatever the expectation was, the kid is going to rise to that. Yeah. Now there's exceptions and there's some kids just like naturally bad kids. And there's some that are naturally really good kids and dogs are really no different than that. Like some are really good dogs and some are maybe a little bit dishonest, but by and large, if we set the expectation for that dog, that this is how it's going to be, the dog doesn't know any different. It doesn't know that, doesn't know that you're asking it to do way more than 99% of the other puppies in this world. Like all it knows is, well, this is the expectation for me. I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. So I always challenge people, like, don't just train for the bare minimum, like, train for something higher, set that as the expectation. And then, then doing the simple tasks will be so easy because there's so much more that you could do. Like I, I often feel in trials, 
like, oh, I wish I had had more opportunity to show off that dog. Like it can do so much more than what it showed because we've trained, we've, we've attempted to train to a higher level than what the expectation is.